வந்து எஸ் ஐ எம் ஏ கிரேட்ஃபுல் ஃபார் டு ஜான் பீப்புள் இன் சார்ஜ் தட் யூ இன்வைட் மீ டு கம் கேர் பிகாஸ் ஐ ஆல்வேஸ் என்ஜாய் வெரி மச் செலிப்ரேஷன் ஃபார் ஜான் ஐ you know i've been reading the manuscript that john gave me this talk and i prepared some comments on that manuscript but it turns out that what he said here was not overlapping much with the manuscript <laughs> so that so but i'll still comment a little bit on things that were not included in this but i'll do it in such a way that you get some kind of extra presentation of those views and uh, i also wanted to start with something that some of you might know john knows it but i don't know who else knows this about the uh, about how john came to stanford how many of you know yeah, maybe only john so then it won't be too boring for the others <laughs> i think this is yes uh, you know i read an article in 1970 called the same f and it was written by some guy i didn't know john perry it was in philosophical review and uh, i thought that was a remarkable article i'd always been very interested in identity and the discussion of identity goes all the way back to plato and aristotle and there's been a lot of discussion up through the ages and uh, among the people discussing this is at that time had been peter geech who talked about the relative identity arguing that you couldn't have a notion of identity without saying the same f or whatever and you had the uh, various others and all these articles i think were rather unclear it was clear they hadn't really got the grasp of how to approach the whole issue and then i read that article and i said that's really a clear mind and uh, it said john perry ucla so i asked david kaplan who is that guy john perry i really like that article and he said well he's a young assistant professor who we have just hired in from cornell but i showed it to my colleagues at stanford and every one of them became enthusiastic about the article and uh, we agree that we should approach the dean and tried to get his permission to invite John to come to Stanford and of course David Kaplan knew that I had liked that article very very much so when we went to the dean at Stanford he approved of that he said well you are free to invite him to come here but to take you know even in american universities this thing can happen fast it took still 2 3 weeks to get the approval and during those weeks i had a letter from the dean at ucla saying that the department at ucla had decided to decide to promote john for tenure what did what did i think about that idea so i <laughs> i'm sure david had recommended the dean there to ask for my opinion because it would be very positive and of course i couldn't tell him well he's not such a good person to promote so <laughs> we had to tell him try to be honest and i said he would be an excellent person to promote but of course now i knew that we will have big problems at stanford which cost to convince a dean that in order to get that person you have to offer him tenure and he's not that far out of graduate school and he has no other publication just one small article that's pretty impossible in most universities but uh, the whole department was very unanimous and the dean was so struck by our unanimity that he said well you cannot give me offer so offered him tenure and they came and that was the beginning of a very very nice cooperation with john and i enjoyed all of this later and uh, i said that identity is an issue that i also was very interested in that's the reason i read the article in the first place but uh, it also relates very much to an interest i had in the, on reference but you know it may have something to do with the located relative to the loudspeakers but in any case uh, the 
there's a problem we have as philosophers. They ask, what are you doing? And you know, if I tell people, I'm trying to find out about identity, what it means that A is identical to B, they wonder <laughs> how can we waste our time on that sort of thing, everyone already. And even the children, when our children wondered what am I doing, I couldn't tell them that I'm thinking about identity. I just told them that I'm doing ethics, you know, trying to find out what is right and what is wrong. And they thought that was a sensible thing to do. <laughs> but in any case, uh, that's, uh, uh, for philosophers, identity is very important. And it's crucial for notions of object, for notion of an object, which I think is, there was much, much more attention than it has got in philosophy. I think that uh, both the uh, perceptual life and our intellectual life is very much focused on objects. And uh, uh, also, of course, as soon as we want to talk about objects, partly uh, as something you need for a theory of reference, you, you get problems of identity. And Quine often had very good ways of putting things sharply and briefly. No entity without identity. So if you want to work on reference, you definitely have to work on identity. And uh, John's article was then the best that I'd seen. I mentioned Gage and Wiggins as examples of people who didn't really seem to see very clearly what was going on with identity. And one reason I was so interested in this is that uh, I'd of course worked with Quine. Who my, actually, Quine was the one who brought me into philosophy because uh, I've been working, I studied mathematics and physics, become, wanting to become a physicist, and I did it for seven years. And uh, I was interested in philosophy, but I couldn't really understand how one could have that as a profession. You could have it as a hobby, but not as a profession. But then I read Quine's little book from a logical point of view, and I thought, that's a way of doing it, which I would like. So I applied for a fellowship to go to study with him. And, uh, uh, and uh, I studied from 57 on. And uh, in the fall of 96, 1960, word and object came out. That was Quine's, it still, I think, is regarded as Quine's best book. When Quine had finished the book, he told me, I'd worked on it for seven years, and you know, Quine's working so intensively for seven years on a book, he said, no more books. <laughs> but he went on to write seven other books. But that one is the most important one. And one in, when I started, of course, to read that book, it came out in October in 60, and I found it fascinating. And one thing he did in it was that he had been criticizing the modalities for many, many years, since the year when John was born. That's when he started criticizing the modalities, you know, connection. And uh, what he finally did in this book was to, to put the final blow to the modalities. He gave an argument that modalities collapse. If you are permitting the normal way of approaching modality, more normal semantics and so on, then you can show that if anything is true, it's necessary. And why then should you distinguish? And, uh, you know, I, in the beginning, I thought that was very interesting that you could now finally prove that modal logic cannot be possible. But uh, I, I looked more at the argument and found that it's too disastrous. It's uh, just, you could apply it to any mo notion where you pick out from among all the true sentences a proper subclass, which is supposed to have a special feature, have an operator in that test. And uh, it turned out you can use it for knowledge if anything is true, then you know it. And for ethics, if anything is right, then you do it. So it was very disastrous. And the problem was simply, and for probability, if anything has one degree of probability, you can prove by that argument that it has any other degree of probability. So it just undercuts 
science and everything. And uh, the problem was then, how can we deal with the argument? And then I found out how to deal with it. And then I worked. And I had three months left before my deadline for my thesis. I, so I decided to write my thesis on that. And uh, uh, I did it in then in late March 1961. And I argued that you cannot deal with that problem if you have the normal Fregean view on reference. Where you, uh, the, what Frege was so proud about is that he could uh, deal with all kinds of linguistic expression in, in the same way. You know, you have sense and reference. Sentences have a sense, which is a proposition. They refer to a truth value, general terms. Have a sense, which is a general concept, and they have an extension, and singular terms have a sense, which is an individual concept, and they refer to an object. This, and uh, Freig several places uh, says that this is an indication that I'm on the right track. I get a unified way of treating everything. But I proposed, and it seems to be forced on us, that we had to have a two-sorted semantics. And what is crucial here is that uh, there are some expressions in language that they behave very, very differently from what Frege had argued. His view would fit sent sentences, general terms, definite descriptions, class abstract. Class abstract is actually what Quine used in his argument. And if they had been like the other terms, then we would have to collapse, but they are not like others. And then you get the purely referring expressions, and now suddenly reference becomes very central, as opposed to that. And the problem was then what kind of expressions are really referring ones. And then what I did was mostly to focus on pronouns and variables. Nowadays, I think one focuses a lot more on indexicals, demonstratives, but also proper names, but depending partly on the use, the different ways of using proper names. And for some of them, most, most uses, they would also be purely referring. So that was the idea. And then, uh, comparison to Perry and Kaplan, what we have just been hearing yesterday mainly, and also reading in John's articles, is that we did have a very good approach to some of these issues in David Kaplan. I think that Kaplan and also Donald, who was together with Kaplan at UCLA, and, and who I think deserves much more attention than he has got, but he has got some attention in a recent book. I think that they are proposing a way of dealing with this. And uh, Kaplan proposed and this, uh, we could call it a kind of one-step semantics because he has one basic uh, idea, one basic mechanism. And he is aware that it cannot handle all constructions. And we have gotten yesterday some example of constructions that cannot be properly dealt with with Kaplan. But, uh, it, and this Kaplan calls monsters. So he's aware that there is something which is not properly covered. And Perry has shown, and that's one of the main contributions of the whole symposium and of a lot of early writings by John, that uh, we had into two kinds of constructions. You had to take two steps in this, uh, in this uh, procedure. And if you do that, then all these constructions can be handled. And I think that's similar. It would be nice if we could have Freudian kind semantics for everything, but the, the step backwards to have to have two sorts of things. And similarly here, it might be regarded as a step backward to have two steps. Things get a little more complicated, but then you can deal with these things. So it's the same as in science. You can propose a very, very simple theory, but if it doesn't account for the phenomena, it doesn't really help. So, so that uh, a one-step treatment is simpler and the one that requires two steps, but not when the two-step one leads to problems. And now I'll focus more on reference, which is the topic and it's, it's called connects, indexicals, uh, demonstratives, and all these things. And one is that when we are talking about 
reference in referring to objects. It's important that the objects are, I call them transcendent, using a word from Husserl, which sounds very mysterious, but what it means with it is exactly the following, that objects are bearers of a very large number of properties and relations. And normally we know only a small number of these properties, so that the, the object is nevertheless conceived of as having numerous further properties. Actually, what we are aware of is just the tip of an iceberg. Objects are very, very rich and have lots of features. Some of them we have thought of and don't think of all the time, but most of these features we haven't even thought of. But they might be discovered, so we can explore objects and find out more about them. But it's important that most of these are uh, such that even we simply are, have to take them for granted. We can't even make them explicit always. And this is important for getting the proper views on reference and the relation between language and the world. So that's one feature of object, which I think is very important for our theory of reference. A second one is that objects, except mathematical ones and so on, can change over time. They can have one property at one time and not at another. And some puzzles about identity and reference are due to that fact that they can change. So we have to have an ontology which permits these kind of changes. And uh, we have these possible changes and things like that, which also have to be dealt with. So that uh, an object is not something that just has the properties at one time and will always keep them. And then a third important thing is that there's a fallibility. You may have false beliefs about objects. May, and all of these features are important when we want to discuss what is a proper way of looking at reference. So that uh, a belief or a set of beliefs is not about whichever object happens best to satisfy our beliefs. Davidson actually put forth a view which is like that, that you just see which object fits best all the beliefs we have. It can be that a good deal of beliefs fit an object which is not really the one we refer to. And above all, it's not like Frege, who thinks that the sense really gives just enough condition to uniquely determine a reference. Normally, you have not enough insight to decide that there's just one object that satisfies whatever you know. There are lots like the clean earth examples and things like that. There will be many, many more intricacies involved than this simply maximizing the amount of the agreement that we could get. And uh, then one feature that has not been so much discussed, but I hope John will go on to include more about that, has to do with intersubjectivity that objects are experienced by us as also being experienceable by others. And we adjust our perception and we adjust our language through intersubjective adaptation. And there's a too little discussion here on, uh, uh, on these intricacies of intersubjectivity. And one reason I'm very interested in Husserl is that he is the philosopher I know of who has given the best analysis of intersubjectivity. He wrote 6,000 pages on that, and with lots of detailed examples. I think examples are a good thing in philosophy, because when you can move, when you can avoid the very abstract terminology and abstract discussions and just look concretely at examples, then you get in. And uh, Husserl then explains how we all experience objects from our different perspectives. And still we experience this world as a shared world, which is experienced by others from their perspectives. And the problem is then that his analysis of these subjective perspectives is so good that especially in France, it has inspired a lot of people to argue that uh, as you are from France, so you know these people, that, uh, that uh, uh, there is only subjectivity, and that uh, there is no real world that is objective and shared. 
I think that Bruno Latour is one example of that. Uh, you know, some French archaeologist found out fairly recently that Ramses II died from tuberculosis. And Latour said that's impossible because the tuberculosis bacteria wasn't discovered until 1882. So there was no, <laughs> nothing around. We call it social constructivism. And unfortunately, they refer to Husserl and his analysis of subjectivity. So it has given Husserl a rather bad name. But if you just read Husserl himself, then he's very, very clear that it's an objective world and that uh, one of the challenges is to explain how through, in spite of all these subjective perspectives, we live together in an objective world. And all these reflections are crucial also for getting the right approach to the theory of reference. And of course, many of the pretty all the examples I guess that John gave had to do with adaptation from, to see how from different perspectives you can still establish clearly how it, we can communicate. And uh, uh, I now get the whistle and. Uh, um, but I'll, I, I know we have limited time, and I certainly want to, want to t start talking about Husserl, but he's a good person to look at for more of this. But what, uh, these uh, terms that I talked about, uh, this uh, idea that instead of having I thought I had uh, Yeah, these two sorted semantics here. These expressions on the left side, they are the referring expressions. And the problem is, how do they refer to objects? And the objects have all these features that you saw. And uh, when I wrote my thesis in 61, I didn't really find any satisfactory way of explaining what the connection should be between these genuine singular terms and the objects. I gave arguments that you need to have two kinds of expressions, and the referring expressions are very, very important. If you try to deal it in one way, the Frege did, then you get into all kinds of problems. But now, how do these singular terms relate to the objects? And there are some ideas you can get very quickly, but when you think about them, you see that they are not very satisfactory. And uh, the proposals that have been made, I have not been very happy with. First, you have one big group called transmissional idea. And you know, that's often attributed to Kripke. But before Kripke ever published anything on this, uh, Geats did. And I have on the next slide a quotation from Geats where he spells it out. And when you read it, Many people who read it think that must be a quotation from Kripke, but it's actually Geach. And the curious thing is that Kripke doesn't refer to Geach, although Geach did it the year before Kripke published his things. And uh, Donald has some similar views, which I think are very interesting for the particular versions that he gives of it. But there are problems. You see, that's what the idea that would most naturally come to mind, that our use of these singular terms is a matter of transmission that's how language is transmitted from one generation to the next. And there are certain kinds of modification that gradually take place. And linguists can say a lot about what factors create tendencies to modification. But uh, so I think there's an element in transmission. But when I wrote my thesis, I couldn't really see. I thought it would be rather complicated because there are so many factors that play a role in that tradition. And uh, then in view of that, Evans, I think, was the first one who proposed a causal theory. And uh, he talks about causal change. That is, there's a chain going from this object to our use of the word. When you see the term causal chain, you should uh, let warning bells ring. Whatever you talk about, reference, perception, whatever, there are no causal change. Cause, 
causality is much more complicated. Lots of different factors come together, and they all have to be balanced against one another. And Davidson actually, in order to get around Quine's objections against meaning, Davidson talked about distance versus proximal. He said, he said that Quine is too hooked on what happens at our sensory organs. Of course, what we talk about are objects out there, and it's easy to see that you can have two speakers, they look at the object out there, and there's a causal chain from the object to the one, and a causal chain from the other to the other, and the object they both refer to together is the closest place where those chains have a common element. But if there are no chains, but it's a very complicated tree, what does it mean? <laughs> Just the closest place where all these branches happen to cross one another. So that whole appeal to causal chain, as soon as you see that then, in any work, whether it be in semantics or perception or whatever, you should just stop and say, here you are on some wrong track. There are no such chains. And uh, there are other problems also with the causal approach. And that is that uh, Evans says that it, through this causal change that information is transmitted to us. And if there will be different options along this change, actually the object we refer to is the dominant source of information about the object. It sounds very nice, but if, uh, I presented my own views on reference at a talk in Oxford. I spent a year in Oxford, and I had Garrett Evans as my commentator. And since I had him as my commentator, I included in my paper some criticism of Evans <laughs> to see what he would respond. And uh, one of the things I focused on was this idea of the object referred to be the dominant source of information. And in his comments, he didn't really say much that I thought was satisfactory, but Credit Ear was in the audience. And he said that the, uh, his, all his terms referred to his nurse because when he grew up, that nurse was certainly the dominant source of information <laughs> about pretty much everything. So John is worried that he might have been too critical against Evans, but that's nothing compared to Ayer, who just brought in his nurse like that. And uh, there are clear difficulties if you have a causal account, because how can you refer to future events via causal change? We don't think that future events have played any causal role in our conceptions at present. And you have problems with reference to abstract objects. And I think that uh, the way in which abstract objects function and how we refer to it, that's one of my main interests. I'm very interested in the philosophy of mathematics. And I tend to be fairly platonistic. And I try to give arguments why the platonistic view is the right one. And in any case, you would like in language to be able to refer to abstract object. I think John often uses the word pi as an example. Can uh, would you talk about pi and how is the relation between that symbol and whatever it refers to? So the, my view is what I call the lay, a normative view. That is, when we use many in singular terms, we commit ourselves to and we signal to other members of our speech community that commitment that we want to stick to one object and we want to do our best to keep on referring to that same object. When you use these kind of singular terms, definitely in singular terms, then you will be in big problem if you switch reference. That's when communication starts breaking down. So uh, now, that was the geese. I don't want to read that, but if you look it up in the Review of Metaphysics 1969, you see, if you glance quickly through it, it's just like Kripke. But the likeness goes in the other direction. Kripke is just like this. In fact, earlier in Kripke, there was a tendency to say that reference is via some kind of essence, individual essence. And Quine, in his criticism of the modalities, at one stage he points out that you can't make sense of modalities without Aristotelian essentialism. 
And then he wrote later an article criticizing crypto and said that here you have an example of how you can do it without essence. But the problem is that Kripke's essence is an individual essence. Each object has its essence, and that's how we can refer to it. But the Aristotelian essentialism that Quine said you are committed to is different. It simply means that if an object has a property, then it will have that property regardless of how we describe that. So it was against Carnap who said that what is necessary depends on the language we use when we talk about objects. So Quine pointed out quite correctly that uh, essence, uh, Aristotelian essentialism, is independent of the way we describe the object. It has to do with objects themselves. And that is an insight which I think is correct. And uh, then uh, in the paper that John had written for this occasion, he did uh, include a humorous story from Kierkegaard. And I thought I should include it since it's humorous. <laughs> and uh, Kierkegaard mentions uh, several places bookseller Soldin, whom he learned about in his student days in Copenhagen. And he was, uh, uh, he was very interested in finding out what the world was like. He liked natural science and so on. And, uh, who, I, and Kierkegaard wanted to focus on the subjective perspective, like the I think French <laughs> ones. And uh, this man was for Kierkegaard a good example of a person who gets so absorbed in looking at the world in the objective scientific way that there's no place any longer for the subject. And then one day he comes back to his wife and is talking and he said, Rebecca, is that me talking? You know, they had a problem with the me. And uh, uh, this example it comes back to often. So in that particular passage that John refers to, it's used as an emphasis on subjectivity. You, mo you should not get so absorbed by the objective world that you forget that there is a subject and it's me who do the talking. And uh, so that's the first observation concerning that, but it also has two other uh, applications in Kierkegaard. And one is, the number two here, he was writing, he was planning a book on a Lutheran minister in Denmark named Adler. And Adler <laughs> says that it's Christ who is speaking through me. So he could continue that sentence, you know, Rebecca, is that me talking? No, it's Christ talking to me, through me. So that uh, was something that Kierkegaard re re reacted against, the pretension that Christ is speaking to me, or through me. And uh, Feuerbach, whom he respected highly, even uh, talked about uh, Christianity being nothing but spiritual ventriloquism. So that's another use of that passage. And uh, finally, it applies to Kierkegaard himself because he wrote a good deal of his things under pseudonym. And how is it he who is speaking or is it the pseudonym who is speaking? Then uh, John also went into Miss Anscombe and I. And this is a passage where uh, Miss Anscombe goes into our way of relating to the I and referring to the I. And she is really pretty good in seeing all the difficulties. And she says that there seems to be nothing but a Cartesian ego that would serve. But, uh, and, but then she rejects the Cartesian ego. So that she didn't really give us, end up with a satisfactory solution for uh, how to deal with the I. And of course, that's what John has been talking a good deal about also how we can refer to ourselves. And this is a topic where uh, Husserl, again, has a good deal to contribute. And uh, we have the memory is one factor that enables us to keep track of ourselves. Uh, but 
and continuities of the body. That's one place. But uh, all of these uh, appear to objects of acts, which can easily be lead to tricky examples that are hard to deal with. But Husserl emphasizes one thing with our grasping of the personal eye, and that is the perspective from which one experiences something. Okay, so there's a perspective on everything. And if we focus on our having a perspective on something, then we get around some of these problems when we hide that we get into if we think of the eye as an object out there that we relate to, like other objects. And um, a lot of the things that John has written about personal identity are of that kind. And uh, Husserl had very, very much to say on this the subjective perspective. But I thought I would not go into him, but I mentioned as a final slide one thing from Husserl, and that is that in 1911 he puts forth an example that is exactly the same as Patman's twin earth example. Patman put it forth 64 years later. And of course it's not that Patman took, took it over from Husserl. This is in a manuscript by Husserl that was not available for Patman at all, but it's exactly the same. The only difference is the name Patnam calls it the twin earth problem, and Husserl calls it the twin world problem. And that was in 1911. In 1913, he wrote his main book, Ideas, and there he proposes a way of dealing with the semantics of expressions that can get around the twin world problem. So I think that uh, to look at the basic ingredients in Husserl's way of solving the problem is a rather interesting one. And what is interesting is also that it's not so unlike what John has proposed. But of course, John didn't get it from Husserl. So thank you, John, and thanks for everything. <laughs>